All right. Bimbo. <laughs> Stephen's work is defined by the collaborations he undertakes, and in many ways, I think of his um, collaborative practice as a, as a kind of anthology of sorts. And um, while it's always based in performance, it, it always ends in a book. Which is really remarkable to see all the collaborations that you produce when you know in the pen and the margins of a physical object. Um, so in some ways, I feel that their two practices complement each other, and I'm really excited to uh, be introducing Stephen Fowler um, here tonight. So S. J. Fowler is a poet and artist. He works in the modernist and avant-garde traditions across poetry, fiction, theatre, sonic art, visual art, installation, and performance. He has published various collections of poetry and text has been commissioned by Tate Modern, BBC Radio 3, the British Council, Tate Britain, Liverpool Biennial, and Welcome Collection. He's been translated into 21 languages and performed at venues across the world, from Mexico City to Brazil, Beijing to Tbilisi. He's the poetry editor of 3AM magazine, lecturer at Princeton University, teaches at Tate Modern, and is the curator of the Emmys Project. Um, great privilege, Steve Howard. Thank you, Steve. I wouldn't normally speak before doing a performance or a reading, feeling like that contextualisation often ruins the performance and the reading, but I feel like I must today. I won't speak for too long though, because I think it would be slightly churlish to overdo it, but I don't think there's superlatives enough to describe the influence of Jerome's work on my own and his influence on people over the last five decades. It's really an extraordinary privilege to be in the presence of Jerome and the things he's done. When I first came into poetry maybe five or six years ago, that's as long as I've been interested in reading and writing poetry, I was so fortunate to get the whole world of poetry at the same time. And I took Jerome's anthologies and his own work completely for granted, thinking they were representative of the wider world of poetry, which they're absolutely not. Without them and his own work, uh, myself as a poet, and I think a lot of people in the world who read poetry, the rest of them especially, would be significantly poorer. A huge element that I'm interested too, that I wanted to draw out with the question that I asked Jerome, as I do organise and collaborate a lot, is how that balances with my own practice, my own singular work, and how Jerome's managed to do that with his own work throughout his whole life while creating these definitive assemblages and anthologies, which he's become so well known for. Jerome's one of the few people whose work I've followed and retrogressively gone back right through his entire catalogue, and two of his books especially have become personally very important to me. Poland, 1931, and Seneca Journal, which I think were published in 1974 and 1978, and seem to be connected to some of the anthologizing and assemblages that Jerome's done too. So all I'll say about what I'm about to present is that there are deep connections between the work that I read of Jerome's and my own that have emanated from similar practices, and that this uh, performance or reading is constructed from both of our poetries, and I shan't define or explain which is which, hoping that you'll be able to recognize the quality <laughs> Salamanca, a prophecy. A city on a turtle's back, a longhouse, was like Jerusalem's temple resting on a whale. Impossible to bring it all together.
The bear is poor up to the sun. The buffalo stirring the ashes. Sun bear, moon buffalo, the great bear. Peace be with you, said the blood to the fat flies. The bear has a stump as a tail. The bear has a constellation that looks down. The bear quadrupedal, the earth's best mammalian killing machine. The bear skim reading the guide to life in six languages. The bear is my middle name. The bear descended from a common ancestor. The bear is dawn 20 million years ago, the size of a terrier. The bear is the language that leads the living forest of the north. The bear murmuring all grass is flesh. The bear has some words I won't dare call a poem. The bear, blonde, populous, happy to see you worry your food. The bear has paws with which you might measure in awful size a human scream. The bear to see white, fat, blubber exposed. The bear seeking seals for it to flail and tear to pieces. The bear is paper, beyond fearsome to awesome. A good friend, the bear with a patchy sun belly rubbed with sand. The bear is a white sickle moon. Not a sweet beast, he is power. Not a sweet man, he is like a muscle tightly waiting to crack down and break a skull, maybe splintering the jaw, maybe making teeth his own almost non-existent row tooth in the center silence. That silence stirs, it is a dance vibrating at each center of each isolated nerve reminds him of the song he wants to sing when dying. And if Beaver sings it to him now, it means an easy death. Like the sloth who accepts as reserves to the beaver, the sloths who lives in trees, harmless, I will grow lips to caress them. The sloth who hangs in the floods of harmful corrections, I am kissing. The sloth who is awful to watch, really, it is in public. The sloth who poses as the love of peace, said Augustine. The sloth who never poses, they are themselves trees animated. The sloth who power throated to William answer asks, am I not a man and your brother? The sloth who asks, is not good sense the companion of all complexions? The sloth who asks, how can you treat me this way? The sloth who living in man's coattails is sacking cities. The sloth who is confused is a famous image visited by many million pilgrims each year. The sloth has a cropped ear. The sloth who has noblesse oblige. The sloth who with tiny fingers is helping each human to cut themselves. The sloth who is hard to see in the mirror while cutting. Even your beard be shorn, poor boy. He's lying helpless. Comes a bear, what enormous sniffer says. This one's our friend, he speaks the language of animals. Oh, little monster man or Indian, the others come now. Eager to tend him with their love, they dangle a power. Tiny scrapings of their flesh, their vital organs, fluids. Strain to the finest drop, they smear first on the scalp, saliva, mucus, semen, tears. Burning his scarlet cover is a map. This wisdom will never leave me, even your lips, funny old bear. Snout, honey ringed, open my own grunt, grunt. I eat your tongue, enormous in my mind, the bear's head grows. I suck his eyes, oh vision, the respectable table, 
drops away, the law is innocent for once and priceless, says the Baal Shem. In the woods, the children break out of their caves, naked, happy. Between life and death, the sun is in the cup. The Baal Shem, walking by river, gets vision of the fish, renewed in china poems that make us laugh and swim. And I must be getting old, my son says. Seven with a light, one line beard. He sits learning the speech of animals who love us. Sometimes will bring us medicines. This one they call the little water stirs up real easy in the dish. Could save your life. The bear robe had no claws. The buffalo robe was headless. The bear is a burning hammer, stomping but completely thoughtless. The bear in a fur bag in need of claws. The bear with a specially shaped mouth for insects. The bear mistaken for a giant sloth but moving too often. The bear is the animal embodying fear of an eclipse. The bear is a whole country of people running. The bear is our son, the bear that kills more than most. The bear growling to make it worse. The bear like a group of people talking so that you can't hear them. The bear sees crows lift their wings to give the signal. The bear who wants to be tickled. The bear who growls, you should have left when I arrived. The bear on a bike is as far as the human imagination can stretch. Poland, 1931, the fish. The dead fish has no eyes, says my son, Poland, has no eyes. And so we live without associations in the past. We live nourishing incredible Poland's, lazy, alive, remembering our mother's pictures in the grass. This is the Jewish poem, not being Jewish, much less being Polish, much less being human. We are miles away and we move towards a live and fat, a tender treasure, an illusion. How clean we are. We sing the fathers having once been in system, now turned deaf. They open stores in Kansas, dream of links to China secret cargoes with a mad impulse to buy and sell. Some mark a pause between occasions, like a holiday, a wedding, more like a game of chess, wherein the figure holding up the queen leans over, dies, but leaves a hole for sleep. I am offended, you as a snake. What use is being without a mind if the one cannot listen? How this is a foot to have not returned the handwritten letter, but to practice listening in the city. Were it not a ledger of badges being lowered and detonations of impulses from the throats of noise like a baby being born with a cord around its neck? Not sad, it would be said to be massive, a sound all the more enormous as it has grown from a tiny thing like the city singing the sound of dying when it is merely tired. With no sun even inside the sun, no lack for small colours, just colour in nature, work of the caved-in sun to stay in port as digger of graves, as if you don't know how to swim in it, you'll sink in it.
Thanks for your job. A Polish anecdote. He died among colleagues, runs the Polish epitaph. The body falls down from the saddle without sorrow, and other soldiers ride their horses over him, singing, Sleep, sleep, dear colleague, and in your dark grave we wish you sweet dreams about Poland, beautiful losses, etc., where each man has many colleagues, only one friend, says Marshal Hilsudski, to be vanquished and not to surrender. This is victory. The rope darkly glassed over like a shattered windscreen. I dreamed of what I don't remember, which is a portent that things will be exactly the same tomorrow. It's child to infancy, a population really growing smaller because its nails face in. And I walked by the side, and he took me by his hand, and he raised me upon his wings, and he showed me those letters, all of them, that are graven with a flaming sword on the throne of glories, and sparks go forth from them and cover all the chambers. Thank you. See if this strange microphone setup you know, actually works. Uh, I have promised Steve, and I'm basically going to do what I promised, uh, which is to concentrate on a series of, uh, of poems that I call variations and then auto variations. Uh, but I want to. <coughs> start with uh, a, a poem that was <clears throat> originally dedicated to, uh, uh, to David Anton, uh, who was uh, certainly my, my oldest friend, you know, with one exception, my dearest friend, <laughs> um, and, uh, and who died uh, uh, about a week ago, less. Uh, <clears throat> <coughs> and uh, fits in with some of the excerpts from uh, the Seneca Journal that you were reading, uh, from that part called uh, Seneca Journal Seven, uh, the Dreamer is dedicated to David Anton. Uh, you know, and uh, David, in his inimitable way, uh, asserted at a certain time in his life uh, that. Uh, he didn't understand, you know, poems written about dreams and so forth because he never dreams. Uh, and I said, David, this is impossible. No, never, never dreams. Uh, he said, you can attach wires to my head. You know, I have no experience of, of dreaming. You know, and he held on to that assertion, uh, you know, for many years until he became interested again in, uh, in Freud's dream theory that, uh, uh, you know, we discovered that 
David probably dreamed during those years of, uh, of New Island. Uh, so this uh, poem coincided with the, uh, the period of no dreaming called The Dreamers. Uh, it comes out of uh, the time when uh, uh, Diane and I and our son were living on the uh, Seneca Indian Reservation in uh, western New York State. And uh, he was with an, an Im image of uh, uh, you know, one who, you know, who might be loosely called you know, a, a shaman or a, a diviner. Uh, and goes on to some other speculations. So I'm, I'm also talking to David here uh, you know, and addressing it to him. That couple sitting in splendor of old houses, Albert Jones and his wife Geneva, were old before my time. He was the last of the Seneca Deviners, died 1968, the year we first stayed in Salamanca with the power to know dreams. Their single divinity, wrote Chemin, S.J., 1650. As we say, divine, the deva in us, like a devil or a divus, deus. When these old woods were rich with gods, people called powers. They would appear in words. Our language hides them. Even now, the action of the poem brings them to light. Dear David, not in the businessman's imagination, but asking, who is Beaver? Forces them out of the one mind, emitting, mouthing the grains of language. As David, that sounds like Deva means beloved. Thus every Indian once had a name. Like uh, Steve Fowler, whose work I very much admire, um, I, I'm given to collaboration. Not always but enough in one form or another. I'm, I'm also given to translation. I'm, uh, and at a certain point, uh, certain processes go a little beyond translation, but not, not unrelated. Uh, so in the uh, last decade of the previous century, uh, in, the, uh, in the 90s, uh, I began to do a series of poems called the Lorca Variations. Uh, and, and what got that started is that I had uh, translated uh, an, an early book of Lorca's, but a book that was published 20 years after his death, uh, called The Sweets, in the sense of a musical suite, The Sweets. Uh, and I, uh, it was a commission from um, Forrest Strauss, a big publisher, uh, who were doing collected translations of Lorca. And I thought I had been promised that they would also publish these translations as a separate book, and this would be my homage you know, to Lorca, who was one of my first poets. Uh, and that didn't happen, and so I went back to my translations you know, and began to pull out nouns from the individual suites, you know, and use them as building blocks uh, for new poems of mine. And that be, that, that, that's the kind of uh, variations it is. So the, the opening poem to the Lorca variations is called Lorca's Spain, a homage. Beginning with olive trees, shadows, beginning with roosters, crystal, beginning with castanets and almonds, fishes. This is a homage to Spain. This mist dogs, this silence is rubber, this is Saturn, beginning with yellow, eclipse, beginning with needles, insomnia, beginning with baskets, the moon. Who is naked? The imagination, wrote Lorca, is seared. This is a homage to water. 
beginning and end. This is a poem in translation from Lorca. Uh, and the, the subject, he just calls it Newton. You know, and that's Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, you know, I kind of call it you know, strange, you know, Lorca writing a poem on, I, I wouldn't say about Newton, but <laughs> with Newton. Uh, and so I, I, I translated uh, and then did variations on it. And that'll give you an idea and variations works. A Newton sweet. And it's a sweet because it's broken in, it's, it's what uh, American poets Robin Blazer and Jack Spicer call serial poetry. It's, uh, uh, you know, one poem, common enough, but, you know, broken into either number or subtitle sections. A Newton sweet. Newton's nose. Onto the nose of Newton, a large apple falls, a meteor of truths, last fruit to dangle from the tree of science. And big Newton scratches his Saxon nostrils, a white moon over these barbaric strings of lace, the beech trees. In the woods, the gnomes astride their secrets, tear their beards out. They tie up death and make the echoes mislead men with mirrors. In a corner lies the secret in the open dead. His companions mourn him, a blue boy with iron feet, a glowing star between his eyebrows. His companions mourn him, and the green lake trembles in the wind. Harmony. Waves rhyme with sighs and stars with crickets, a tremble in the cornea of the whole cold sky, a dot, a synthesis, infinities. But who joins waves with sighs and stars with crickets? Just hope these geniuses be missing something. The proof creep keeps drifting by among us. The philosopher's last walk. Newton was taking a walk. Death had followed him, strumming his guitar. This is very Spanish. Strumming his guitar. Newton was taking a walk. The worms gnawed through the apple. The wind hummed in the trees, the river beneath the branches. Or Wordsworth would have cried. The philosopher was striking unimaginable pauses, was waiting for another apple. He ran along the road, he stretched out by the water, he saw how his face would sink in the moon's reflection. Newton wept, and high up on a cedar, two old owls yammered. Slowly in the night, the wise man went back home. He dreamt enormous pyramids of apples. Replica. Adam ate an apple from the virgin Eve. Newton was a second Adam, sciences. The first knew beauty, the second the Pegasus bowed down by chains, and neither one was guilty. They are two apples, pink and fresh, but with a bitter history, the severed breasts of innocence, poor child. Question. Why was it the apple and not the orange or the polyhedral pomegranate? Why this virgin fruit to clue them in this smooth and gentle pippin? What admirable symbol lies dormant at its core? Adam, Paris, Newton carry it inside their souls and fondle it without a clue to what it is. From the Lorca Variations, Newton. One. The men had green feet that vaulted them into the open where they could flaunt their secrets. Lace brushed lightly against their nostrils as the apple tree loomed over Newton with its fruits. It is so Saxon to bind gnomes with string, to watch your echoes drifting off in secret, your lost companions jangling irons in the wind. Not every boy has such sad eyebrows, nor would every corner spare an inch for death. In the woods, the moon 
showed Newton where the truth lies. Following his nose, he slammed into a meteor called Newton. He mistook it for a science that was white, like beech trees or like beers. But once he caught it in his mirror, saw it turn blue again. At length, it looked like every other star or lake. Two. Every wise man considers himself another Newton, a philosopher musing beside trees and water, going for a walk or coming from a walk, pulling genies out of waves and sky, with which sigh makes a perfect rhyme. Their corny is a focus on infinity and disregard the lowly cricket, just as Newton did, and just as Newton knew the wind, though Wordsworth knew a certain word to be the night's reflection, so apples floating on a wave of crickets make a synthesis more powerful than stars. Philosophers should play guitars then, reaching for those apple branches where the moon's a lowly apple. Pyramids adorned with owls express a kind of harmony and stars are dots and are a proof of death more powerful than worms. What if the river strikes a pose? The cedar will show a face that brings it home. Three. There isn't a clue that the fruit into which Adam bit was an apple and not his lady's breast. Above them, Pegasus kept flying past all in the name of science. The virgin handed him a second apple, which Adam turned into a questioning of history. Deep in its core, the virgin saw souls rise and fall, a symbol Newton later found inside a pomegranate. Only a child can play with apples and touch beauty. Newton and Adam both were satisfied with Eve's reply, the first she gave when she woke up in chains, her innocence laid by. Paris in the other tale, held up an orange. So I was doing that with various, uh, various other poets. Um, and uh, at a certain point, tur turned the uh, the process on myself. Um, I began to go back to earlier poems of my own uh, and follow the same kind of procedure, uh, picking out, isolating, rearranging uh, the nouns in the poems, you know, and creating new poems using those uh, uh, as, the, uh, as the building blocks. And there was a kind of sense that I brought along with it uh, uh, that I ascribed to Henri, Henri Matisse, uh, writing, I guess as he was reaching a certain age to the Italian uh, painter artist uh, Gino Severini, one should be able to rework an old work at least once to make sure that one has not fallen victim to one's nerves or to fate. And again, when you have achieved what you want in a certain area, when you have exploited the possibilities that lie in one direction, you must, when the time comes, change course, search for something new. So I went back to uh, a series of poems that I had written uh, in the 1960s, and um, uh, trying to locate a series of poems called The Seven Hells of the Jikoku Zoshi. Jikoku Zoshi is a Japanese squirrel uh, and, you know, depicting uh, the hells of the uh, of the afterworld, and uh, I was as much taken by the by the titles as um, uh, yes by the, the the images. But the images are pretty terrific, and you know some versions of this I might as well carry the images along.
But I will uh, read the, uh, uh, the, the opening poem. And then another uh, poem. So this, this goes back to about uh, 1960, 62. Um, the first hell of measures where swindlers measure fire in iron boxes. How can any of you know what it feels like to count coins in hell? You have the rest of it to keep you busy. Your eyes are troubled enough. But down here, the nights are longer and the days are senseless. Down here, the rain falls upside down from iron boxes. The smoke inside the narrow room pulls back. It winds around the bedpost like a colored cloth around the leg that's bleeding, violet and green with pain. What should we say to our fingers? Should we remind them of the cool silk yards they handled behind counters, the healing lotions nailed, rolled between the, the palms? Should we tell them that the earth crawling with black grief at least was wet? One, two, blue coins of disaster are ringing in the night. The distant call of metal birds is like the rhyming in bad poems before your birth. You would not know me now. The fire at my ribs has emptied me of flesh and words. I stand here with the others, counting, letting the numbers fill my head. An outlaw. One, two, three, four, five. I want to turn aside, but hell won't let me. Hell is the outraged customer who slams the cash box against my hands. A candle drips along the sidewalk. Wax covers the windows of a small store and blurs the sun. A darkness full of crates through which I walk, thinking of other hells than this. The skin cries under the brand of intellect. The seed of numbers raising questions of the mind that's helpless. The fevered brow. Smash it to hell. You have a right to it. One, two. Three, four, five, the white eye watches through the window. Where we live is where we always lived, the sea of death. Variations on the hell of measures. <coughs> How can any of you know what it feels like to count coins in hell? Hell has windows as the skin has numbers, and the sun flashing on the sidewalk blinds the little customers who bathe in it. In my head is on my flesh, the poems appear, responding to my call. My poem, palms turn violet and blue, smoother than Chinese silk. My room is filled with rain as hell with fire, while an eyebrow slightly raised signals deceit. The other hells are kept in store. A hell of numbers follows one with rhymings. Ribs grow heavy. The night is meant for grief. No lotions over legs or fingers can assuage. Lost in the smoke, we wait for day to come, for coins to burn the swindlers who demand them like a brand. Crates pile up, windows break. Death makes the mind turn white. Hands open to hell for others. Let its fires trap the birds who fly through them. Let disaster make them all turn black. Let them cry out with pain, the counters filling up with cloth and boxes, broken open in the night, unmeasured, boxes smelling of the sea, the intellect imprisoned in their darkness, knowing the right questions, but afraid to ask. They could pliable like wax and let it drip over the outlaw's cash box. Words have their birth in it, and metals drawn out of the earth and melted give us coins. The years ahead are green. The bedposts where we rest are iron. Our eyes are iron, too, and blind us. Call it hell. The second hell of thieves, where thieves are ground in mortars. The thieves, the thieves, the lovely thieves are no more. The shore is washed by the sea, the sea is combed by the wind, the wind sleeps all day in the chimney, it moves through the house in the evening, it wakes us, it opens the door for the sea, it walks where the thieves walk, it leads us into a night without windows. Comfort me, stay with me, light my eyes, the lovely thieves are no more. 
The thieves are crying, their voices are crying from hell. Their tears fill the snow with lost coins. Their tears burn my fingers, my fingers that move through your hair. How gentle your voice is. Respond to them, answer them. Think of the pain they bear in their skin, the thread that runs from their skin to your voice, from your voice to the wind. Respond to them, answer them. The thieves, the thieves, the lovely thieves are no more. The shadows are silent, the silence has entered your voice, your voice is asleep in the shadows. Wake again in the night, wake again full of fear, wake to the shadow of death at your window. The ladders that hung from the sky are falling, the thieves are falling, their blood is filling the earth, the earth that awaits you, the earth that destroys you, the earth that has stolen your voice. The earth voice is crying with hunger. A single grave waits for us all. A single stone grinds us to water. The water flows to the sea. The sea is asleep in your voice. Your voice that could flood hell with tears. That could ease the pain of the dying. But only the thieves cry tonight. They cry where no one can hear them. Their voices cry from the stone. Their voices cry where we sleep without dreams. The thieves, thieves. The lovely thieves are no more. Variations on the hell of thieves. The thieves, the thieves, the lovely thieves are no more. When a wind blows in from the sea, a door swings open in the light. White as hell nearly blinds us. Night begins later, the skin on my fingers flakes off. A rank wind shakes the ladders we climb on, the earth more distant for which we still hunger, the sea filling up with our tears, our voices lost in the wind, thieves who scour our shores at evening, whose voices sound under our windows, whose tears hide our pain, cry out with one voice, past shadows and windows, one voice for earth and one voice for water, and thieves dressed like thieves, a hell like no other, a house overlooking the sea, on a night when coins ring and death has a voice like a thieves' voice, earth returning to earth, then to water, a voice, thieves dissemble in dreams, thieves and a sea and a chimney down which thieves clamber, more thieves in the snow, skin and hair growing white, a shadow that thieves spill like blood, like the voice from a stone, the voice of the dying. Thieves and voices, shore, wind and sea, tears and eyes, fingers spinning a thread in fear of the sky and the earth, of thieves lost at sea, a grave and a stone left for thieves, where thieves vanish. So I, I called those auto uh, variations, and um, many of them are published in this small book, which uh, just came out from uh, uh, Press Two, 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 Two publishers in uh, in France, uh, in in both uh, this English edition and uh, a companion French edition, and. Um, continue to do auto variations of uh, this. So I'm going to read three poems uh, from further auto variations, uh, which I subtitle at the moment, uh, Reminders of a Vanished Earth, you know, and uh, may Jonathan, you know, even be a little contribution to an eco-poetics. I'll read three, three poems from that. And for the third one, I will also read the earlier poem. Uh, not so early, but uh, you know, from earlier in this century from uh, which the, the words come. 
Further variations, reminder, older variations, reminders of a vanished earth. One, the poem as landscape. The definition of a place is more than what was seen or what was felt before when dreaming of the dead, the way a conflagration wrapped itself around his world, leaving in his mind a trace of dunes, the fallout from a ring of mountains, reminders of a vanished earth, the landscape marked with rising tufts, the hardness of clay tiles that press against our feet like bricks, the soil concealed beneath its coverings through which a weave of twisted wires crisscross the empty field as markers to commemorate the helpless dead. The ones who fly around like the, the helpless dead, the ones who fly around like ghosts bereft of either home or tomb in what would once have been their world, the count fades out beyond 10,000 leaves them to be swept down endless ages, fused together or else set apart, lost nomads on the road to desolation, a field on Mars they wait to share with others, dead at last. Two, never done counting. Enclosed by matter in all my thoughts, screen for prophecy, when I wake up on Mondays, the night sky is hanging above me, Galaxies shedding their images, fading unknown in the half-light, a light that confounds me. Nothing we know is unreal, and nothing is real. There is only the face of a woman blind in the sun, and a voice that cries out in a language like French. When she raises her arms, they look distant and lame, something there that won't work, but falls flat against me, I will follow her, up to the moon will watch her paint herself red, with no sense of the distances still to be traveled, no plot to adjust to, but numbers that show me the little I know, the way one vanishing universe shrinks till it swallows another. There are worlds here hidden from sight, whose ends are like their beginnings. The world in daylight turns dark, the blaze of noon caught in their mirrors, as the sun slips through our fingers, never done counting, where the globe has dropped out of sight. From a book of concealments, and uh, this was written along with, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, for those of you who were here earlier, it was written along with the uh, the Romanticism volume of, uh, of Poems of the Millennium. Uh, so this one you know, took uh, the title you will recognize from Coleridge, uh, A Deep Romantic Chasm, uh, and it's dedicated uh, uh, to uh, poet Michael McClure. A deep romantic chasm beckons him. It leaves no time to hide from light in spite of circumstances and the way the street flows like a stream from no source, nowhere. This season with its birds newly arrived, the first one on a fence mortal as you, a harbinger of days to come. Another word, a false return, the spoken still unspoken carries us off. The cavern of the universe widens each morning. My head fills up with dew, the father writes having no home but where his shadow leads him, in greasy shirt sleeves, heavy lids, blotched faces, the men pursue a trail of tears, unbuttoned, captive to a dream, a starless galaxy, the deeper sky, a field of images, measureless and mindless, absent their God. A deep romantic chasm. Head facing downward, I descend the chasm, little caring about space or time, my face caught halfway between dark and light, a mix of random chance and kindred circumstances before I reach the bottom and a narrow street alongside which I spot a darkly churning stream and follow it until I reach its source. Here is a world outside time and season. Reason. 
only broken by the sound of ghostly birds that blast us till we find that we've arrived nearby, a field behind, a battered wooden fence. The specters in that world stare out at us, move back and forth until they cover the horizon, come forward, forward, rising in their legions. All they have to offer is a turn, a word, a sound that we can hear and answer in return. What has long been known but left unspoken, words from inner space, the tongue turns off, the dead will learn to speak again, the universe is theirs and covers them until they flee at morning, leave us in a dream still, faces awash with dew. This will be the final book the poet dreams or writes, whose home is in his mind, or maybe elsewhere, follows it around the world to where it leads him, a space forever dark, an air so heavy that he cannot push through it or recognize the faces waiting for him as before, too distant to pursue the world once full of smiles, now dark with tears. I am not he, the wanderer, the captive, the one who lives his life as in a dream, the messages that reach him from a dying galaxy fall on deaf ears, echoes of an empty sky, the final world bereft of sounds and images return to what it was, adrift and mindless, the grim memento of its absent God. And I'll end the reading with the, uh, uh, the poem that, uh, that concludes uh, Barbaric, Fast, and Wild. And again, it's a, it's a poem in, uh, uh, in dedication, uh, <clears throat> this one to an another absent friend, uh, Ansel Hollow, uh, who died uh, what, about three years ago now and lived for a, a long time, as, as you remember, in, the, uh, in London, where we first knew him. <coughs> and it, uh, the poem draws on uh, some words and images that, uh, that come out of barbaric fast and wild. Uh, you know, but no, no, not in any uh, sy systematic way, it's just, you know, it's written. Um, yeah, it, it, it accompanies, uh, and I called it a, a further witness. I had written an earlier book called The Book of Witness, a further witness uh, for Anselm Hollow. And it begins with um, a line from uh, pre-Socratic, Greek poet, philosopher, uh, Empedocles. All things possess intelligence and a share of thought. One, I who am dead call to the living little brothers how absurd your walk is, unencumbered and adrift you run across life's stage. Your words are manacles and cage your mind. I know enough of you to sense your pain freely and fiercely. I move into a deeper space where none will reach me. Here I strike a blow, an imbeciling fluid from inside my body, covers the ground between and blocks all entry. Birds like little knives dive down the sky. Le mal de ciel, the phrase I hear and fly from. Two. Reduced to bits of light, a thin white line, nerves end or eyes eclipse. It sticks inside my throat. I try but cannot cough it out. The edges of a tongue sharper than nails leave me numb and distant from my own recall of pain, the pattern of small trees that block my path, a flash of lights back of my eyes, twitter and call of birds made out of air, the fragile bones, my fingers crack and weave like wires, blood, a gas flows in a line, so thin it fades from sight, tick tock, the clock inside your heart, a tremble clatters, night will overcome the sleepers, we will raise a sheet and watch them as they fall, 
like phantoms down a thousand worlds. Three. My word for it is not enough. It takes a certain force. The mystery of mind spread through the universe alive in each of us, our thoughts returning to the source, uncharted, absent each time another friend departs. My breath feels distant, days condense to minutes, nights to days. The mystery is in the words alone he writes. The rest he cannot know what bears it in his mind. All things possess intelligence and a share of thought. Coda for Diane. And it starts with uh, some lines from the uh, uh, great Japanese outside poet uh, uh, Iq. Writing something to leave behind is yet another kind of dream. When I awake, I know that there will be no one left to read it. Immersed in light, the final blindness seals him shut, his body crammed into a moving car, the future and the past colliding, blown apart. I sign the final email who the others are unknown to me. The corners of my mind are dark now like the universe itself unspoken. Dropping from my hand, the book is not a ball of light. The pain I feel in leaving cannot be your pain. Another kind of dream invades me. Loving you, the way ahead, the far side of a wall arises. Newly built, a further witness beckons in the name of love as powerful as this. The present tense is all we have. I count the days with you. Our fingers join and come apart again. We live on borrowed time. Words left behind. The book inside my dream. Too bright for those to whom we write or speak. And know when we awake, there will be no one left to read it. And with that, of course. <laughs>